DG, Hey Dutch. When you went back to Puerto Rico in the early 90s, did you have any interaction with Jose Gonzalez? How did he treat you? Did you want to have anything to do with him after the Brody murder? Thanks, and by the way, it was here where I live in Harlan County, Kentucky, that Ron Wright's plane got burnt up. Well, okay, what, first question first, Puerto Rico, Bruiser Brody got yeah, uh, the, Yeah, so this is after you uh, returned yeah. a few years later, the wrestling business is just done and in I'm America a, and yeah. you needed some money and, and, coming back. It, yeah, I, I said a couple of times that the, the, the wrestling machinery or the machine that we had known before was gone. <clears throat> it's like the industry died. Unless you work for WWF or WCW, you just couldn't make enough money in the wrestling business <clears throat> to survive upon. The only reason I went back to Puerto Rico was because of lack of anywhere else to go. Because I would call WWE very hard to get in there. Plus, I was older and I didn't have, I didn't weigh 260 pounds. So they were trying to, they, they said, uh, if we figure something out, we'll, we'll call you, which they would if they had figured something out, except they didn't spend a lot of thought on me. WCW was the same thing. You know, just because people know you in a resume, this doesn't mean you can get booked. I mean, it's up to other people to do this. And of course, WCW, I, I think I would have had more harder time with them than I would have had with WWF because at least they knew who I was. WCW, those people at CNN, they didn't never heard of Dutch Mantel because they weren't wrestling fans. But anyway. So when I went back there, the, the Brody thing happened in 88. And the only reason I went back is because there's nowhere else to go. So I worked a deal and I went back and Vader was there. I mean, not Vader, Invader was there. And I had as much interaction with him as I possibly could get by on. Because I had nothing to say to him. He was an idiot to begin with. He was an idiot when I knew him before. He was still an idiot. And one night I sent him a finish from the dressing room and the referee comes back and he said, Invader, you know like a finish. I went, okay, tell him to do that. I give it to him, sent the referee over. He comes back about five minutes later. Invader says, send him to the finish. He don't, he, he don't like a finish. That's twice. I didn't go the third time. I said, you tell Vader, Invader this. Tell him to do whatever goddamn finish he wants to do because I'm done with him. Tell him just do it and put himself over and get the hell out. And that's the way it stayed for about six months. Finally, I broke him down. One day he came up to me in the office. He said, why don't you use me more? I said, why don't you goddamn cooperate? I said, hell, you don't want to, all of a sudden, you want to do your own finishes? Well, do them. I don't care because I'm not involving you in anything that has to do with that main event. Because until you learn to, to work as a team, if you don't work as a team, do it yourself. You'll take a shower and leave. That's all I want you to do. Because I couldn't get rid of him. Because I guess, you know, but I went to Carlos Colon, who was the owner of Jovica, you know, they wouldn't agree with me to get rid of him. So I just did nothing with him. So I finally made him come to me. He wanted me to come to him. I got, he was some big star. I'm not doing it. I'm not kissing his butt just because he, he drew a few houses down there. And, and he's an, he has a, a, a weird way of even looking at the wrestling business. And I was never a fan of his. I, I never liked working with him, to tell you the truth. Because he believed his own publicity. And I just didn't like to work with him. And I had as least uh, interaction or communication with him as I have anybody in the wrestling business. I had more interaction with guys in the first match than I had with Invader because I didn't appreciate talking to him. I didn't like him. 
But I, I didn't like him before the Brody thing. So afterwards, he did nothing to, to change my mind. And somebody said, do you think he will, he'll ever, he can be recharged? I said, no, he won't. Why not? He's guilty. I said, well, uh, American law has it that you can't be tried twice for the second mm. offense. Double jeopardy. It's, it's double jeopardy. Same thing in England. We did have double jeopardy. We abolished it long, bef- long ago. Well, but he was never said he wasn't not guilty. I mean, he wasn't innocent. He was just not guilty because he pled self-defense. But he went in there with a knife. And then he just, that night, I will never forget that night. And I never, I hope I never relive another one like that. No. Because it was a crazy, crazy night. I want to ask you this, and this is a very serious question, is when you went back in the early 90s, I mean, <clears throat> probably two questions, actually. Uh, one, I mean, did you have, uh, have any moral misgivings about going back, even though there was nothing really, uh, no money really to be made outside the two big companies uh, at that time in, in uh, the United States? And two, did you ever fear for your life when you went back down there, at least at first? No, I never feared for my life. I wasn't afraid of them. I mean, I don't think if he'd have said something, we would have, first thing I would have grabbed, I would have looked around and grabbed me a knife. If, he, if he's going to have one. No, he never, I was, I, I stayed away from him, only in the dressing room with witnesses around. But I never got, got, got afraid or scared when I was in Puerto Rico. Because all that thing was, oh, they're, they're going to kill the guys. They're going to do. They were. They weren't going to do that. I mean, they're not. They're not completely immoral bastards. Because Carlos, he's actually a pretty good guy. And Joe Vica, he's a cheap bastard, but he's. I don't think he would have killed me, and I don't think Jose Gonzalez would have. He better be glad he he walked free from that. And the reason you know why he walked free from that. This is an, just an offshoot of what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Brody was painted on TV as a crazy guy, a crazy man. And all those fans who got called as jurors on the jury, they were all fans. So they were looking at, at Brody as he's nuts because his gimmick was believable when he'd go out there yes, and throwing that chain around. Well, you know, normal people don't do that, but they couldn't separate in their, their head that he's not like that on the street, but they didn't know bruiser. They just knew he was like six, eight and 310 pounds or whatever. And no, no fat. And if he went toward those other Puerto Rican fans with that, our Japanese fans with that throwing that uh, chain around his head. Yeah. People ran because he scared them. So when they are sitting on the jury, they put themselves in invader spot. And when he went in there and then why he took a knife was for, for, for survival. He didn't know whether he was going to get mad and go off. But then again, another time, this is what, what I think clattered it the most. Brody was an American. He was from outside that little island. Invader was a Puerto Rican who was like somewhat of a national hero, or everybody knew him, not national hero, but everybody knew him. So when they sent the jury out for to deliberate, Guess how long they took? Very, very little time. About less than an hour. And they came back with the verdict, not guilty. And the way they presented it during the during the uh, trial, he never, uh, Invader never claimed he didn't do it. He claimed he did it. He admitted, I did it but I did it in self-defense. 
So legally, he was kind of covered, I guess. And the only two guys that know what happened in that dressing room that night, one of them is dead and the other's not talking. So we will never know what happened uh, in that shower stall or that shower room in, uh, was it Cogwas? I think it was, I think it was Bayamon. Bayamon, I think. It was those two guys. And crazy night. I got to sleep about the next morning, maybe five. I got up at 6.30, couldn't sleep. And that was the only time I had ever talked to Brody's wife up till about six months ago. I finally finally met her and, and talked to her. She mm-hmm. called me that night in my room and wanted to know what was going on because somebody had called her and t- told her that Brody had been, I guess, stabbed. But I didn't try to put it to her that way. I said, yeah, there's been a little bit of a, a an incident, so – and I think you should get to Puerto Rico as soon as you can. I didn't want to unduly alarm her unless she needed to know. But she caught the next flight from San Antonio. That's where she, they were living. And she came to Puerto Rico. And the first one she met off the flight was Abdullah. He was going to his flight. And he told her. But he told her in such a way, like, he said, he's gone. He's gone. She said, what? He's He's gone. He's gone. What do you mean? I mean, that was a, like a, a, a brunt way to tell her, a blunt way to tell her. So, but that's what happened. I don't want to relive it, and I wouldn't advise it for anybody else. 